right, here we go. Three, two, one. Welcome to Sounding Point Podcast. My name is Joseph Christensen, and with me today is Alyssa Wang. Alyssa is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University and recently graduated New England Conservatory with two master's degrees, one in violin performance and one in conducting. She has performed with leading new music ensemble, Far Cry, and is the resident violinist in Hub New Music, a mixed string and woodwind quartet that has recently released a fabulous new album called Soul House, which we are going to discuss today. We know each other through our mutual friend, Evan Kahn, with whom we've played much chamber music in the past. And we actually met for the first time at Colorado College Summer Music Festival, where we um, played under the under the baton of Scott Yu and where Alyssa has um, done some conducting herself. So Alyssa, it's fantastic to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start by talking about your new album, which I listened to intently and it like knowing you and yeah, just knowing you, I was like, okay, I, I, I am looking forward to this album. I can't wait to see what it's about. <laughs> couldn't see to, couldn't wait to see what you were cooking up, but then listening to it, I was, I was legitimately moved more than I expected, <laughs> which, um, I was already expecting to be moved. <laughs> so I was, it, I had a really, um, deep reaction to it. And I thought it was totally brilliant. So um, congratulations on that album, Soul House. Thank you so much. And honestly, that is all that we can hope for is to just make people feel something good. <laughs> can, can you describe, because I think it's the coolest composition um, and just this, yeah. this project was so interesting. Can you describe the the idea of this album? Yeah, well, there are a couple things that make this album unique. The first is that it was written for the group that I play in, Hubney Music, which is not a standard chamber group. So we're we're not a string quartet, we're not a woodwind quintet. We're some we're kind of a mixture. So there's a, a violin, a cello, a flute, and a clarinet, and that's the instrumentation. So all the music we play has to more or less be written for us because there isn't repertoire with that instr- instrumentation existing already. Mm-hmm. So, obviously, the credit goes to the composer, and in which case, uh, the composer of Soul House is an incredible man named Robert Hanstein, um, who is just an incredibly talented composer, musician, um, and a friend of ours as well. And he wrote this piece about his childhood home. So it is just totally seeped in nostalgia and that kind of childish wonder you know, that, um, uh, that is just so precious and exists in that kind of more innocent time in your life. Um, so every movement, uh, there are nine movements and every movement is a depiction of one of those locations in his childhood home. Uh, so it's just gorgeous and, and sweeping and playful and funny. And, um, again, nostalgic. I mean, it's just an incredible composition. So really the credit goes to him for that. I I was listening to this album and I was reading it kind of had liner notes and or whatever you call it on on uh band yeah, camp. The, li- the liner notes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um and as I was following along with it like you know the last movement is the secret place right yeah, yeah. and it just took me back I had a place that I would go to at my childhood um home growing up in uh, San Luis Obispo County and um yeah, it was just so interesting to hear his like evocations of different parts of his house and the different memories that it was attached to. Yeah. And as as it was going through the album, I found that how subjective and how personal these movements were, I realized how many of these emotions I had in common with him. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think the point of that last movement being called Secret Place and not an explicitly named room is specifically for you as a listener like you know you are you have the understanding that he's thinking of a specific place in his house and it might be a different place for you but you still tap into that emotion Mm -hmm. um so in that sense it really like applies to everyone it's it's extraordinary 
Yeah, it's incredible. I would go down. Um, I'll, I'll tell you my secret place. Okay. <laughs> okay. Ready? <laughs> you know, it's funny. It was... We tried to get Robert Honstein. Yeah, yeah. To tell us his secret place, uh-huh. and he won't tell us. <laughs> so we don't know. <laughs> um, mine was it, technically it wasn't in the house; it was nearby. It was down. We lived on this hill, and down the hill there was this creek, and there was it was like a very small creek, but the water was flowing in it pretty consistently, which is yeah. rare for California. Yeah. And um, there was this little island, so you could like step over the water and go into this little gravel island in the middle of the creek, and there were just trees around, and I would just sit lay down on my back on this gravel and just look up and uh, I would just talk. I'd literally like talk to myself and just think about my life and music and whatever I was going through at the time. And I just have so many memories of just this like connection with nature. And um, so when you heard the last movement, did you immediately think of that play? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's so cool. I'm I'm sure, I hope the composer watches this and, and sees that. that, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That'll make a it was yeah such a such a beautiful album i um i i wrote down um i wrote down my impressions on each movement and mm-hmm. i wanted to ask i mean i'll just run these by you if you have yeah. any any extra comments on them i'd love to hear them if not totally totally fine so the first one was I wish I, I I didn't write down the title of each of these rooms. Okay, I, I can I can tell you. Can you. Rem- yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you can. <laughs> but the first the first movement is Bay Window. Bay Window, yeah. Um, I, re- I wrote reflective, beautiful, haunting. That was for the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah, that lush. one's supposed to be that one's supposed to be about you know the reflections that you see, especially like at night if there's lights, because stars outside, and you see little pinpoints of lights coming through. It's like reflection refraction like mm-hmm. everything to do with windows and light and the physics of that he got all of that color with like harmonics and the strings yeah. and sustained notes in the winds yeah so it's super effective yeah the ensemble i somewhere in the liner notes um as well it talked about this uh interesting combination of the violin cello and then flute and clarinet right yeah and um he i think he gave it the uh the word of viscous combination of sound where, where it's, it's very tactile. It's an extremely, um, sensual. I'm not sure what the right word is for it. It's very, uh, uh, the, the combination of sound. I I mean, you, you can compare it in some ways maybe to, um, like, uh, sorry, what what am I thinking? A quartet for the end of time, you know, adding the clarinet clarinet to the, um, to the string and piano group. And, there's something about the combination of sonorities that's really otherworldly and it and it it sonically works out in such a way that you're not always aware of which instrument you're listening to. It's really and cool. That is a that is a comment that we get often actually. Mm-hmm. Especially in live concerts, people will come up to us and say uh, there were times where I didn't know who was playing what note, mm-hmm. which is so cool especially if you think about how different a string instrument is from a woodwind instrument. I mean it's like very few similarities going on um but if it's written well you know and smartly then all sorts of like trippy acoustic things happen when you listen it's Mm -hmm. it's amazing yeah yeah it's beautiful so um the second movement which was stairs stairs i wrote reflective beginning brilliant ending yeah, I think the point with stairs is that um, maybe you start on the top of the stairs, and then as you go down the stairs, you get faster and faster. Oh and faster. yeah, yeah. Maybe cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I for the third movement, which was alcove. Alcove. I wrote slow, stately, almost medieval. Yeah, and I think his. Um, impression was like a nook somewhere Mm -hmm. where you could just sort of sit with a book read a book and everything is very still and calm there's not no running around yeah very peaceful Mm. yeah number four is hallway hallway Mm -hmm. i said rambunctious fun some danger (laughs) yeah and i might be wrong about this but i think the impression is that he he and his siblings are like running down the hall like they're playing mm-hmm. 
and they're running and they're tripping over each other. And yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe danger in, in the, in the kid way. Yeah. 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 Number five. Yeah, number five is backyard. Backyard. Now, this wrote, one is a doozy. Yeah. And, so some of these are doozies. Your yeah. playing was incredible. Um, so jaunty, syncopated, mm-hmm. cannon, chase. Yeah. And the you I mean, you nailed it with those last two. He he took the idea of kids chasing each other in a back in the backyard and made that into musical form where we yeah. literally chase each other. So it starts out, there's like the melody and it's, it's, it's a fugue, right? So mm-hmm. it starts out as, you know, first subject, second subject comes in and then eventually we're all playing it at some point. But then as mm-hmm. the movement goes on, the spacing between the fugue gets closer and closer. The strato. And then, yeah, exactly. And then you can't even call it a fugue. Then maybe you call it a canon, a four part canon where at its most um, treacherous moments, we are one eighth note away from each other. <laughs> yeah. Four, four yeah. people in a row playing exactly the same melody, one eighth note away from each other. Yeah. And it's not a simple melody. The melody is in like no. different time signatures and their syncopation. <laughs> and, their, and it, yeah. And it is one of those high blood pressure moments in yes. concerts where you are just in this zone where you're not even in your own body. You're just like, kind of moving and you don't even know what's happening and you don't even really know what you're hearing (laughs) because you're hearing the echo of yourself behind you and in front of you and oh my gosh i've had i mean i've had experiences with like bartok string quartets where obviously you learn the part but then when you're like playing it you're almost not you can't believe you're doing (laughs) because to listen to it is yeah. So active, it's so hard to follow. And while you're playing, it's just you kind of almost go and in, get into this groove. Yeah, it is very much about groove and being just so rhythmically, like machine-like accuracy with your rhythm. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of metronome that went on yeah. to make that movement happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that was a really exciting one. Um, then there was number six. Yeah, number six. It was driveway, right? Driveway, that's right. Yeah, which was uh, I wrote insistent, so it has like kind of these really re- um, repeated um, gestures, yeah. like yeah. these downward scales, yeah. w- winding and brilliant. I wrote. Yeah, that that movement is a workout for me. It's it's really tiring. <laughs> 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 so we, I remember that recording day. I had to just really mentally prepare myself for that because I was like, man, like we're not going to get through this if I Mm -hmm. burn out too quickly or whatever. So yeah, that one has given us a lot of grief in in, in that it is, it just requires so much physicality from everybody. Um, And, but it's quite effective. And his idea I think was running to try and get the, the shotgun seat in the car. Oh yeah. (laughs) Like battle to get to the front seat. That's what that is. It's a, <laughs> relatable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to anyone who has siblings. Very yeah, yeah, yes. If you didn't have siblings, this piece, you might be like, <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The seventh, noble and quiet, I wrote. Yeah, that one's Copper Beach, which is about a tree, um, which I believe was in the front yard of his house. And this is the one that everybody like cries to when they hear mm-hmm. it. Cause it's so the, we use an A clarinet in that one, which mm. just means that the, the clarinet has a sort of more somber mellow tone and has a slightly lower range than a normal B flat clarinet. Um, yeah. And that, that one's incredible. Yeah. So, so beautiful. So beautiful. Um, yeah. I've tried to categorize the language of this, um, composition as we were, as we were going like, I was trying mm-hmm. to compare it to some, mm. some other composer. Um, I couldn't really, I mean, it almost, I, I mean, I, I, f- I feel like it's dangerous to even try. Yeah. There's so, so uh, many different kind of genres composers out there. People have associations with either. I would say it reminded me at times of Stravinsky times okay. of, yeah. of Barber, um, uh-huh. Copeland, um, Bartok, um, maybe some, yeah. Maybe some Philip Glass in there. Totally, I mean, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. I mean, 
I think that's credit to Rob because he has a very singular voice that yeah. is very uniquely his. Um, I mean, you could talk all you want about influence and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, um, yeah he, he's definitely got a distinct voice, which I think, you know, I'm not a composer, but there's so many. If I were a composer, I would almost be overwhelmed by the onslaught of yeah. different kinds of influences that – I mean, you can do anything nowadays. Like you can write – something we always say – my group always says is that like composers can kind of write whatever they want now. Like there isn't anything that's kind of like uh, scandalous if you write, you know, like nothing scandalizes our ears anymore, you know? Um, So I, Rob's piece comes at a good time, you know, because some people think new music is really gnarly and, and kind of hard to listen to. And, but he presents whenever we end concerts with it, people are always coming up to us and saying, wow, I didn't know new music could be this beautiful. And, um, you know, he's not, he's not trying to be anything like complicated and and scratchy and blah, blah, blah. Like he, he really laid down something that was like genuinely authentically beautiful and, and harmonically pleasing. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we could use some of that. Yeah, I, I could use it, and I did. Yeah. <laughs> it was great, <laughs> and uh, we are we are big uh, we are big advocates of new music on this podcast. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, yeah, I think it's what it's funny you you brought that up. I I've only slightly read maybe the first um, eighth of the book, um, Anxiety of Influence by what is it? What is his name? Do you know Harold Bloom? Um, but I, I, I just I find. I, I find the concept fascinating because he get, basically has this theory of uh, of influence. How um, as, the further we go on in history, the more creators and artists are essentially have to reckon with the the history of whatever they're doing. So there's wow. a, at a certain level, you either um, you either integrate the art, like you you integrate a, something from an art. So if you're influenced by a composer that you love, you might take on attributes of them or reject it. So if there's something you mm-hmm. reject in the past, right? And then you obviously add your own voice yeah. to it. And that's what is the development. But it's, I think, yeah, that's hard for me. And the few times I've tried to compose, there's like this feeling of how do I, how do I um, sort of pick through all these little corners of my brain and come up with something my own. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's cool with all the resources we have, but it can be overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And Robert uh, Hanstein does an incredible job in this. He does. Um, so going on to number yeah, there's, eight. There's two more movements. Yeah. Number eight is landing. Landing. This one uh, I wrote blissful, gorgeous, and uplifting. Yeah, absolutely. This one is a journey from a sort of um, a place of stillness, maybe uncertainty, and sort of erupts into like ecstatic, you know, kind of uh, there's an incredible cello melody that comes in the end. And um, then the violin is like soaring on top and it just ends in this big whoosh and kind of lets yeah. you go. It's yeah. very satisfying. Oh man. It's yeah. That was, uh, that was incredible. And last there's the, um, of course the secret place Yeah, I wrote in order sinuous thoughtful surge of passion and serenity yeah yeah you covered it boy <laughs> this is a this is the best plug for this album that you're gonna get. <laughs> if you're not curious about what this music sounds like at this point then we can't help you <laughs> get out there get out get there and hug. listen to it <laughs> buy it it's on all the streaming yeah. services etc i have not had a musical experience like this in a while listening to an album that's so, so y- awesome to hear y'all get out there what where's the best place for people to find it um if you want to purchase it i would say Bandcamp. if you want to just stream it we're on apple music amazon music and spotify yeah. great okay there it is yeah. well <laughs> I hope you're curious now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you have any uh so how how is Hub uh new music? Like what what what's the uh what's the plan now? You you released this album, any new projects? What are you yeah. guys doing? Well, I mean, incredibly, we were supposed to record two albums in, within the next like year and it all of it got pushed back because of yeah. coronavirus. So we've got sort of a a backlog of recording mm-hmm. that we need to do which 
is very TBD. Um, yeah. And, you know, it is what it is. And we'll just, we'll do it when we can. Um, but meanwhile, we've been doing a lot of virtual concerts, um, which are concerts that were supposed to be live. Mm-hmm but we're now filming them ahead of time and sending the file right. over to the presenter and then they're putting it out there on their streaming services. Um, so we've done, we've done, I think three of them now this weekend, we're about to record three more. Wow. So there's actually quite a high demand for them we're finding, which is awesome. Um, but you know, there's no denying that the process itself is like a little depressing, <laughs> you know, in the sense yeah. that we work really hard and then we finish and it's like, <laughs> you know we're like sweating yeah. like the cameraman's yeah. just like okay we're done now you know <laughs> um, but so, you know this is what you got to do it's what we're all adapting and that's how we've adapted and it's it's gone very well so can't mm-hmm. so you're you're in boston you guys right. are are recording in a space yeah. together yeah okay we are we are together <laughs> that's nice. yeah yeah we've sort of made the quartet our pod like our social pod yeah um, so that's how we're keeping safe. And it's been fine. It's been working. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Quartet San Francisco has been doing all remote and oh, wow. it's, um, it's better than nothing. <laughs> it it's is better, better than, than nothing, than... but it kind yeah. of is, uh, yeah. it, it wears it, on you after a while. Honestly, it just depends on your mindset and at what point in the pandemic you are. Like mm-hmm. in the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, I would rather do nothing actually than do virtual because that's how like mentally taxing it was for me. I don't know why I had such a visceral reaction to like not wanting to play. Um, Mm. But, you know, this is a singular event in history. So I think we we can allow ourselves to feel a wide spectrum of like good and bad. And if you're feeling great, you shouldn't feel guilty about it. And if you feel terrible, you shouldn't think that there's something wrong with you. Like it's just... You just do what yeah. you, you feel what you feel. <laughs> yeah. It it's I think that was one of the hardest things for me to kind of um adapt to as the yeah. pandemic went on. Because I mean I've been very fortunate that my teaching has remained stable and even increased That's since amazing. the pandemic. Yeah. And so so from that point of view, I'm I'm doing great and it feels great, but um and I think we're similar in this way, but I I had didn't really practice 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 for at least a month and now i'm i'm i've gotten up to the point of um doing little one-offs like i just released this little schumann duo video Um, i saw that that was awesome (laughs) thanks i mean and that was really fun and it's also for me it's easier because the um the scale is really small so it's just hard to stay motivated for um a long project that, that that with no clear payoff. Um, so it's been harder for me to be like, oh, I'm going to learn a concerto. It's like, for, for oh, what? Yeah. No, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm scheduled to play a concerto um, in February. And part of me is like, is it going to happen? And so like, yeah. even though I know that I have something in the future, I'm like, do I even practice for it? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm right at the point where it's starting to become like, you need to make a decision. Yeah. Like, Why do you start this? And I'm yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> what it's, concerto? It's, um, it is the Brahms double. Ooh, love that one. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say any more details in case it okay. does or does not happen because sure. I don't know. <laughs> I Fair. hope it happens. Yes, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. So I mean, that was interesting for earlier on this, in this podcast, and and my understanding was that you also had a kind of extended departure from the violin or absence. I did. And, yeah, um, I did. And that, yeah, yeah, that was wrapped up in a lot of different things. Um, so um, in August of 2019, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And then the pandemic happened in what, Feb- February? January, yeah, uh, March. March, 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 yeah. everything. I guess down. we we reacted to it in March, even though it was happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. We won't get into that. We'll yeah. Into that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I I had like a total meltdown in my musical life, so I stopped playing the violin for about a month and a half. I would say maybe maybe a month. I sort of gave up in March. 
Um, and then in early May, my dad passed away and my plan was actually to like start playing. Like it was about a week before he passed. And then obviously I had to go home because, you know, everything was complicated and things weren't looking good. So I went home and then after he passed, I was like, well, I like can't play the violin right now. Like, I, like that was inconceivable. So my like plan of not playing for like one month or a couple weeks ballooned into like not playing for like close to three months, which I have never done before. I've never even not played for a month, let alone yeah. two, let alone three. Yeah. So when I did kind of pick the violin up again, it was like a very, it was very strange. I was like a very emotionally, uh, not unstable, but just in a very unfamiliar territory. Um, and then obviously physically I was way out of shape. Like yeah. my chops were not there. So mm -hmm. um, it's been, I st actually, honestly, I still feel like I'm trying to find that um, quality and like the feeling of playing mm -hmm. that was so comfortable to me before. Yeah. I still feel like I haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, and I guess all, I think especially violinists can relate to this of just like the discomfort and <clears throat> trying to find a way to make a quite, a quite awkward instrument feel uh, natural, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is almost impossible, but you know. <laughs> yeah. It's try our best. It's um, interesting. The, I mean, uh, the physicality of playing the instrument. I remember I would, when I was younger, I would just practice, like my answer is just practicing more hours. And yeah. that is yeah. definitely one of the, you know, answers to getting that level of comfort with the instrument. But as as I've gotten older, I've had to find ways of getting that with less, <laughs> less uh, lead up time. Yeah. Um, but it, to me, it's also attached to like your general comfort with the instrument as your voice like i i'm i mean i'm curious what you have to to say about that because i um i think i um didn't know what to do with the violin so even when i did practice it in the in the months through the pandemic i i almost didn't have anything to say i felt like and it yeah. was physically uncomfortable and also mentally uncomfortable well there is a a void we could call it right when you play and you know that no one's watching you right or or when you're preparing for something that isn't going to happen or um playing just for the sake of playing you know then you start playing to the void and i i think the void is a very dangerous mm. place some people find meaning in it hats mm -hmm. off to them but like yeah. I, <laughs> I was like i'm not like if the tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it you did it fall whatever that quote is you know yeah. like if there's no one to play music with and there's no one to play music to why are we playing music so yeah um i totally know what you mean about losing the voice because I, I think we all have realized now that our voice was much more than just what we had to say it was also yeah. who we had to say it to yeah and once you took away the second half of the equation, then you have an incomplete equation. And then, yeah, exactly. What, you know, what do you do after that? So, yeah, I think we're all going to come out of this pandemic with just an incredible appreciation for yeah. audience members, for like interactions with other musicians and all kinds of collaborations. You know, I mean, we're never going to, at least our generation, <laughs> we're, we're never going to take that for granted yeah. ever again. Nope. Ever again. We can't. We can't. Yeah. And, yeah, we talked about that when Evan, shout out again, <laughs> was on the podcast. Um, we talked about the same idea yeah. of of the audience being an inextricable part of the equation, like the feedback loop of what it is absolutely. to be a musician and creator. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, so, I mean, can I ask, how are you doing? I mean, yeah. I, I was, I was heartbroken. <laughs> I was heartbroken to learn about your dad and I mean, I, I honestly don't know how to talk about it. Um, you know, I, I, I was really honored to meet him and, and uh, yeah, right. really, you did meet him really that one time. Yeah, you twice, did. twice for, uh, yeah, we had a, 
just for people who are listening, um, mm-hmm. we had a concert at my ha- at my parents' house, which I had done many, many times in the past. And this one time, I thought, let's do a string trio. And so Joe got out his viola. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which now that I think back on it, that was kind of like a surreal two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you was... did get to meet my dad that one time. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. M- makes a big impression on you. He makes a big impression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, speaking of like voice in the violin, um, you know, I have really been thrown into this like kind of, I mean, like a very extended period of grief because of this. And so I've had to think a lot about like, how does that affect my playing? Does it affect my playing? Um, you know, does it change what music means to me? And my, um, my mentor who's, you know, I consider, you know, my greatest violin mentor of all time, um, is a man named Andres Cardenas. And he was talking to me like shortly after my dad died. And he was saying, you know, like you are never going to make music the same way again. And he said it with this definitive nature of like, It doesn't matter what you want. Like, this is what's going to happen. It's going to change your expression as an individual forever. And not only have I I found that to be abundantly true, but I've also found that um, something that's that tragic that happens to you really affects, like, every facet of your life. And I think you are sort of under uh, an illusion if you think that, you can sort of compartmentalize it or keep it. So as something that is so personal um, and um, such a, a method of expression as making music, there's really no way that it wasn't going to affect that. So it, it's definitely very interesting. Um, like I found that when I pick up the violin, first of all, my instrument itself was something that my dad bought. So the physical instrument has now taken on like a far more symbolic meaning than it ever has before. Now it's like a gift from my dad. And in that sense, it is part of my dad. So Mm -hmm. every time I even see my instrument, touch my instrument, use the instrument, you know, whatever, there's that reminder and that like connection, not in a, not in a negative way, I would say in actually a very positive way. Um, And then when I'm actually playing music itself, um, you know, it's so interesting. I feel almost like this is going to sound bad and it's not exactly what I mean, but I think you'll understand what I mean. I almost feel like I care less Mm. about like what happens in a Mm -hmm. concert or in a rehearsal or like even how I sound, like the things that are on my higher priority list, like the priorities have changed. I see. You know, it's not so much like, Things like mistakes, like mistakes just don't bother me as much anymore. And I almost feel like more controlled and more calm and just more like internal, like everything is more internal. So I don't feel the the need as much to like writhe around and like move and do. And that's saying something for me because, you know, I like... <laughs> I like move way too much when I play, but I feel less inclined to do that now. I actually feel like I sort of just want to like be very centered and do my thing and find this, this authenticity in my expression that taps into the authenticity of grief of losing somebody that's that close to you. It's like, um, there's a kind of like, really, you're not like, that's not something you can fake or something that, you can hide from it's just sort of like always there um and i think before when i was trying to find certain characteristics certain attitudes in music it was almost like i was like faking it i mean i don't even want to say faking it because that makes it sound like if you haven't lost someone you don't know how to express music and that's not what i mean um i just mean that now that i'm on the other side of this i understand more deeply kind of like i guess the emotion that I am trying to convey. I see. It's not something that I have to imagine anymore. It's like yeah. very real. And so in a way it's like easier to access, I guess. Right. I don't know. I don't know if any of that made sense. No. I, I mean, my impressions on that are that it sounds like it's the difference between acting 
something and um and like experiencing something yeah. you know it's like and, yeah. and there's no um not that one is better or worse right and you need to we as as artists we need to whether we are writing whether we're acting whether we're performing we have to kind of use empathy to enter into situations and um and maybe psychological states or his, historical periods that we had no contact with, but that we, Absolutely. that we yeah. are inhabiting in an indirect way, but, but it is, it is materially different from actually yeah. not acting it, but experiencing something. Well, the, from, word, the word that I really liked that you just used was empathy, because I think it's, it's really fascinating. Like what, what has happened to me now is I, sort of see the world now divided into like people who like have experienced intense grief and people who haven't again not that one is better than the other or anything like that just that i am it's like empathy is really feeling the thing that the other person is feeling yeah. and when it happens to you you know exactly what they're feeling so um if we think about pieces of music that have to do with like loss like the Berg Violin Concerto, you know, mm -hmm. um, or, uh, you know, any number like the string quartet that Mendelssohn wrote after his sister died, you know, mm -hmm. it's no longer just an attempt at empathy. It's like real true empathy. Um, and I'm sort of that I, I see people differently now, music aside, like I just, I see people, um, as like, Oh, like, I understand how you feel, you know, you've been mm -hmm. through something traumatic, like I understand, like, and people who haven't. And that sort of goes with how I like see myself too. Like if I am putting like a mirror to myself, I can see like the old version of myself that was sort of like unaffected by something this intense, like almost like a, I don't want to say naive, mm -hmm. but um, just more like pure, maybe, uh, maybe that's not even the right word, but I can like, see that version of myself and I can see this version of myself and because that junction happened so recently both sides are very um stark like yeah I really see them and that's that I think that's just a part of growing up I mean mm -hmm. everybody crosses that line eventually yeah. sometimes it happens when you're really young and sometimes you're lucky enough to say it happens when you're much older mm -hmm. um and it is kind of, you know, going back to Soul House and this kind of youthfulness, a lot of that has to do with not being touched by trauma or any of that, yeah. right? Um, so there is something sad. And I think the word nostalgia has a sadness to it mm -hmm. because there is, I mean, it is sad. There is like a change that happens. Yeah. And I saw myself go through that change. Like I was like looking at myself from a distance. I mean, it was like really crazy. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, okay, we're leaving this part of your life and now you've entered into this new phase yeah. where you no longer be exempt from, you know, from grief or from loss, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been very, it's been difficult. It's been, um, I mean, it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever been through. Um, but you know, like the amount of comfort that I feel being able to get my feelings out in a musical way is immense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and I think a lot of people who are musicians will feel this way too. I mean, it's, um, thank God we have ways of expressing beauty and pain and all of that. And in, in a, in an artistic way, you know, mm -hmm. cause that, it's just so necessary for humanity to have access to that. Um, and hopefully when the pandemic is over, people will realize <laughs> that that's missing and then they'll come crawling back to us. <laughs> Please play us more concerts. Um, <laughs> we need it. Um, so, um, but yeah, thanks for listening to all of that. It was very. I mean, th thank you for saying it. And I mean, I think, it, yeah, obviously, the loss of a parent is something. Hopefully, I mean, it's it's probably in some ways more natural than the reverse of parent losing a child, but it is. Yeah. Everybody knows that that's going to happen eventually. Yeah. It eventually happens. And I think part of, for me, nostalgia is like this. 
it's a, kind of a reminder of the inexorableness of time that yeah. time has this just it's a one one way kind of aspect to it that is usually in our day to day life. Okay, and we're back. Sorry, we got cut off in the midst of a deep and and uh, difficult but beautiful conversation and thoughts we're having. I, I was just saying about nostalgia that it there's an exa- inexorableness to time that in our everyday life it's just we take it for granted but but there are certain lines we cross that we start that we have some perspective on how stark the distinction is between life and death where we we come into contact with eternity and uh we start to feel our own place in it and not, not only that but it's um it's a time to reflect on sort of the lasting um, the lasting things that people have left us with. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm blessed that both of my parents are still alive and I haven't lost anyone in my close direct family um, since my grandparents. And that's, that was when I was really young, but I mean, probably for me losing my violin teacher, uh, Randy Garachi yeah. was really hard because um, you know, he also was young. He was, you know, in his fifties and, uh, yeah. and he, he passed away very suddenly. And, um, I didn't, it's like, I hadn't kind of undergone the processing I needed to, um, I mean, th- thankfully I had seen him right before, like a couple months before. And, and we had a nice, nice, uh, contact then, but, it you know it wasn't until after he was gone that i i reflected on all the ways that he changed my life and um everything that he meant to me and the the things he left behind and the way the world is not the same after he's gone mm-hmm. and um and obviously how i'm changed so i mean it's a it's a beautiful it's a good opportunity to to take stock of that even i mean it yeah. doesn't it doesn't help to reduce the grief but it's you know it's a beautiful yeah. Thing. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's probably not recommended, right, to try and like pretend like there is no grief if there is grief. Um, but yeah, like objects have been like a huge comfort to me, and that idea, like exactly what you said about um, the things they leave behind. Like part of the things that they leave behind, yes, there are physical things like my violin, but um, <clears throat> there's also like you. Mm-hmm. You know, you are in a way one of the things that he left behind because mm-hmm. he imprinted certain stories and characteristics and personality things like on you. And, um, you know, I am very determined to embody my dad. And you met him very briefly. And I bet you in that brief moment, you got a ton of things. Like mm-hmm. you probably sensed like his um his ability to have like conversations with everybody, his loudness, like how giant his personality is in a crowd full of people, like everybody knows he's there, everybody knows that he's talking, you know, he's a great storyteller, he's he's a doer, he's organized, he got everybody at he contacted everybody in the block, made sure everybody was in our home made sure the place was all set up, you know, and then after the concert was over, it was like, you know, he's engaging with everybody and he's mm-hmm. very, um, very quick, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, um, this- really just a, just a confident stylish. I mean, it's like quite extraordinary. Like you, he had no insecurities and yeah. I don't know really anybody like that. I mean, that's really extraordinary. So mm-hmm. just from that short time, you, Obviously, I've had my whole life, but like you have that impression of him that mm-hmm. lives on. And I mean, I, I uh, have one story about him, which is that um, so we did the concert at your house. We did that Beethoven trio. And then the next year we did the um, Britain at that. Yes. Commu- yeah, oh, I totally forgot about that. I don't know how <laughs> Yeah, we did. So I met him Quartet twice. Number but two. We did. Quartet that's number right. Two. Mm-hmm. And um, it was interesting because i uh left my shoes at your house 
<laughs> and I think, I don't remember if it was through you or if I got an email from him or I forget exactly what happened, but he, he was basically offering to bring my shoes <laughs> to his office in San Francisco <laughs> for me to pick up. Um, and I mean, he's, he had no need of doing that, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it was so thoughtful. I was, I mean, I, I didn't end up, I mean, I felt guilty. I didn't want him to have to do that. So like carrying around this schmuck's shoes all over the city. <laughs> but, uh, so I ended up just picking up, picking up the next year and he, he was they giving me a hard time about an that. entire year. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they were there for like an epically long time. <laughs> yeah. That's so, so funny. He, he did give me some crap about that, which which was righteously deserved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I totally forgot about the shoe story. Mm-hmm, that's so mm-hmm. funny. Um, but, yeah, but so he, I, you know, I, he, you probably got, I mean, there's so many things about him that leave such an impression on people. But I find myself being like not only not only what would dad do in the situation but i know exactly what dad would do and it might not be something that i would do but i'm gonna do it anyways Mm -hmm. (laughs) so um you know like what would dad do in this situation where um i ordered something at a restaurant and i ordered you know uh my steak medium and it came back well done what would dad do like i would just sit there and bear it but dad would go excuse me (laughs) this is unacceptable give me a new steak for free right Mm -hmm. now and that would that kind of confrontation would make me uncomfortable but Mm -hmm. now i'm like okay i know dad would do this i know i wouldn't do this but i'm going to keep his personality alive through me and i'm gonna yell at the waiter and get them (laughs) to get me a new steak (laughs) (laughs) um so that's been like part of <laughs> part of my my way of like keeping him close and and just like not not having it be like a situation where someone close to you passes and then like their presence is gone forever. Like I I don't yeah. think that that's how it is. Like I I think that um, you can still keep them like very close to you and you can emulate them and um, you know they're what. Was that line from, is it Harry Potter or something like that? Where it's like, those who love us never really leave us. Mm. Um, I, it's so cliche, but it's really, really true. Yeah. Um, it's really true. And I realize that this has nothing to do with music, but. But it also glad- has everything to do with music. <laughs> right. No, sure, sure. No, I, but I'm, I'm super glad we're talking about this because I, it's, um, you know, uh, I think sometimes about like performers and I'm like, man, like, like you don't know, like if you see a soloist come on and like just blast through like a Brahms concerto or something, like you don't know what's going on yeah. behind, you know, like you, and I think about that. I was like, man, if, if the pandemic weren't happening and I had to perform and my dad had just passed away and I had to get on stage like a week yeah. later, like what, you know, would anybody know, would it be difficult? Would it be, you know, how would it be different? You know, in a way I've sort of been yeah. spared from that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a, it, music is so deeply personal and like, yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense that grief would, would add on to it, but. I've um, definitely thought about that. And it's just, def- it's like uh, when, at, when you're at a normal job, I'm sure it's extremely taxing as well, yeah. but it's no. not quite the same if your job doesn't require you to express yourself emotionally right when when you're going through something like that emotionally how do yeah. you balance yourself and yeah i mean you know I, that's why i'm so appreciative of you being open to talk about it because i think that's part of it i think part of grief and which so many people have experienced if they've lost someone from covid or Sure. Or, or or whatever the case might be that I think there's just oh, yeah. so much grief right now for different yeah. reasons. And Oh yeah. I mean, this is a, I mean, the world is grieving right now. I mean, we are, this is not normal that the tiredness that people feel, the non, the lack of motivation, these are all symptoms of grief of not necessarily people lost. Although in many cases, yes, people being lost to COVID, 
but like a livelihood that's been lost and a kind of security that we thought we had. Um, you know, I mean, we've lost all semblance of normalcy. Um, and so we are all collectively experiencing a certain level of grief as a human race, which n- I never thought that something like that would happen in our lifetimes. But, you know, we are living through a moment where like the whole planet is just going through it at the same time. Yeah. Um, especially the United States. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think to, again, and I, I say this to so many people, I'm like, if you are feeling like you can't do anything and you feel stuck and you feel like you have no inspiration, you know, it's not because of you. It's because like what we're going through right now is really terrible. Um, and it's okay. You know, it's okay to put stuff away or to be like, I can't do this right now. You know, it's like, yeah. you just got to do what you got to do. Um, There's no right or wrong way. That's right. To deal that's with right. It. And I think with, with the knowledge that, you know, we are going through this together. It's not mm-hmm. like something's happened to you and everyone's leaving you behind, right? We're all going through this together at the same rate and we are going to get out of it. Like one day, hopefully soon, you know, we'll be able to make music again together and, and think, and we'll have learned something collectively as a society. Um, which the biggest lesson is that you should vote. That's the biggest <laughs> lesson. I'm just going to put that out there. Know. Yeah. That's what we've learned. <laughs> vote. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> we'll keep that in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, uh... going through, go, Losing my dad in the middle of a pandemic was also like a, a kind of surreal combination of yeah. bad things that is like very hard to describe. And it's almost like, like a weird dream happened, like dealing with it at the same time. And I mean, it's, it's a mess and so many people are going through that right now. So yeah, um, yeah it'll be, <laughs> we, you know, when we come out of this, Joe, we are going to be so bulletproof. Yeah. We are going to be indestructible. And I just look forward to the generation, musicians particularly, a generation of indestructible musicians who, um, you know, we don't have to prove that people need to hear us. We know we're still here. We went through a pandemic and we didn't stop. That's right. You know? <laughs> so That's right we don't have to prove ourselves to anyone anymore. It's mm-hmm. like, like we know exactly what we want. We've decided that during a pandemic, we're going to continue to be musicians, even though that maybe makes no logical sense, but we did it anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we're never going to take for granted these things that we took for granted before. Um, you know, it's a big lesson. It's not all bad. You know, we're, we're going to come out of this like much stronger. Yeah. It's, it's been a time and what you were saying earlier about almost reaching a, a stiller place in your playing and and having that lived experience rather than only um, only empathy or um, pro- projecting yourself into an experience, which is of course always important in art as well. But my point is that um, we all have that experience now, at least of the pandemic. Yeah. And speaking for myself, uh, it's been a time of self-starting and and as cliched as it so- sounds, finding my voice because <laughs> God knows there's no one else asking for it. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. uh, I mean, besides the projects we have lined up, it's the world is not asking for music right now, obviously because we don't have the live performance, we don't have the ability for it, but but the the world also needs music more than ever. Absolutely. It's not asking for it, but it needs it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I've I've learned so much as far as just you know, listening to my own creativity and listening to my own sort of imp- impulses artistically as to where I want to go and and um we're we're going to be bulletproof. Hell yeah. Yeah, we are. <laughs> I mean, we the we have been so vulnerable during this period, you know, I mean, which is why I've loved actually this discussion and not shying away from these kind of more difficult topics. Cause, um, I think vulnerability 
is what makes you strong. Um, and we are all vulnerable in this period. And so when we come out of it, we're going to be like, let's go, you know, we're exactly, it's going to be amazing. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see it and experience it. Um, and you're going to come out of it with a podcast, which is so yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Amen. 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 <laughs> that is, that is, I mean, we should almost just end the podcast there, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's a great ending, ending note. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, let me just double check since I have you here. Um, I think, and, I mean, I need to talk to you about um, your conducting. You, you are the second woman conductor we've had on the podcast. Um, right. So I, I would yeah. say in, in eight episodes, not, not too bad a record. Not too bad. Yeah. So, how, uh, how'd you get started conducting? Gosh. Um, I have no amazing story. Um, I never thought I was going to be conductor simply because I'd never seen a female conductor. So I was like, well, clearly this, it didn't even enter my brain that it was something that I could do. Cause I never saw it visually. And then, um, I think I took a class and then I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm good at this. And then I was like, why did I think I couldn't do this before? And then after that, it was like, well, now I want to do it. And then I did it. So it was just the, the roadblock was not realizing that it was an option. And then once I realized it was an option, um, it was like, I guess I'm going to do this now. And an opportunity came by to get a degree in it. And I did that. And then an opportunity came by to start, like an orchestra in Boston. So I did that. Um, I make it sound simple. They're not simple things, <laughs> but, but in the, and at the moment it kind of was like a very um, binary decision. Like, do you do this or do you not do this? And I said, What's the group, I, um, the group is the Boston festival orchestra, which was supposed to have its inaugural season this July. Um, and obviously that didn't happen, yeah. but it's going to happen next summer. Um, and that was an orchestra that I basically started from scratch with, um, my friend Nicholas Brown, um, who is a clarinetist, um, also in Boston with me. So he's like my business partner soulmate. So we just sort of put our heads together and tried to dream up like a, just a summer orchestra that only meets in the summer. Um, and so that's something that we're going to have to, you know, our first concert, which is going to be next summer, is going to be a momentous occasion because it'll have been after an entire pandemic. So we're trying to figure out like what kind of programming makes sense. That very first concert, the first piece of the first concert of the first season after we've experienced all this is like a yeah. very important moment. And so we're like, does, a, does such a piece exist hmm. that can be appropriate for for that kind of a beginning mm -hmm. we will find out <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i'll think about that <laughs> yeah if you think yeah, of something I mean, tell me <laughs> like don't Justify. say like Mahler's resurrection symphony you know, hey, there we go. a little too on the nose <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> but there's something kind of short out there that maybe a movement of something i, I don't know but we'll figure we'll find it <laughs> we'll find it yes we will um that's amazing. And I wanted to ask, um, so now that you've graduated, you're violinist, conductor, um, you've been in school for most of your life. How long have you yeah. been out? Um, a year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. Of which a third of that has been in a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been a wild ride. And how have you adjusted to being out of school? For me personally, it was really, I mean, I, I didn't have nearly as, <laughs> nearly as much um, to deal with as you did. But I think I, uh, it took me a while to figure out what I was about and yeah. um, get my footing. So how has that been for you? Well, um, it was like, how do I, I'm trying to think of a, I have a friend who does metaphors and analogies really well, and I'm not that person. And so I'm struggling here. It was like stepping into the right body. And like, I'd been like living in the wrong body my entire life in school, in desks, writing essays that I hated. 
taking notes on things that I knew I didn't want to learn about. And then I just stepped into like my true self. And it was like, oh, like it was like, um, you know, breathing for the first time. I, I, I think I, I realized officially when I graduated, I was like, not only am I never going back to school, but I don't actually think I was very much of a school person ever at any point, college, grad school, any of that. Like I was there for the lessons. I was there to practice. I was there for the orchestras, but like the actual school part of it, like you could have taken the institution out of it and it wouldn't have made any difference. In fact, it probably would have been nicer for me. Um, so that adjustment, it wasn't, it's like I've been clawing my way to that point for the better part of, you know, 20 plus years, essentially. Um, so I was happy. <laughs> I was like, it, I could have had nothing lined up and I would have been happy. But luckily, mm -hmm. luckily I had Hub New Music um, and I had some ideas cooking and, you know, I played with some orchestras around town, et cetera, mm -hmm, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, Boston is a great place for that. So I was very fortunate in that regard. Um, but despite any, all of that, I was still just like, wow, I'm finally living my life. Like this is the life that I've been preparing for mm -hmm. my whole life. <laughs> and I, I wish more people felt like that because mm -hmm. not, not to hate school. I don't wish that, upon me, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think there is a lot of fear about graduating. What do I do? What do I, um, uh, you know, how am I going to have security? And I just, mm -hmm. I wish I could just tell people like, like, don't worry. Like you mm -hmm. should be excited. Like don't be in denial that you're going to graduate because you're going to graduate and it's going to happen. And you're not going to have that like comfort under, like it, just prepare for it instead, like yeah. own up to it, lean into it and be excited about it. I mean, like being an adult is so much better than being a student. That's <laughs> true. I don't have a schedule. I do what I want. Like I choose the gigs that I want to play. I create the projects that I want to create. You know, I mean, it's like, it's so freeing and it's so awesome. Um, and I, I wish, I wish everyone felt that kind of enthusiasm, yeah. you know, Th that's the advice I, I have thought about if I could give myself advice. Yeah. Five years ago, Joe versus right now, mm -hmm. I would I would say don't worry, um, yeah. get started. Don't um, don't question the direction. If you're interested in it, go the direction that you yeah. want to. And um, yeah, I, yeah I, I mean, for me personally, it was it was. Uh, I mean, it is it's so much better. <laughs> but um, that's that's an encouraging. Uh, encouraging exhortation there Alyssa thank you yeah 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 don't be you know you just got to be brave yeah got to be brave and look at us we're in the middle of a pandemic and yeah. everything's fine I mean yeah, kind of. we're, I mean it's fine <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's fine yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Alyssa this has been awesome I loved all the topics um thanks for getting deep with me oh Thank you for going there. That was, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you being open about that and vulnerable. And um, I'm really glad we can talk about that. Me too. All right. Thanks. Everyone go listen to Soul House. <laughs> All right. I'll see you.